Integrating Awareness with Being. This is a course of study mostly inspired by the teachings of G.I. Gurdjieff, a 20th century Russian Sufi and Christian mystic. His work helps to bring about inner freedom from the prison of our own ego structures, which are made up of fixed beliefs, attitudes, and conclusions. He was also the inspiration for the astounding work of the Enneagram, which is included in this teaching. The Enneagram describes the characteristics of the ego and the divine attributes of the authentic inner self. If we have people in our life that irritate us, make us feel guilty, resentful, or angry, they are compelled to press our buttons because we are radiating some old script that they happen to be reading. And it's coming from some old dead carcass that we've been dragging around and it's made up of lies and illusions. It has nothing to live on except our beliefs in it. Who we are is radiating out of us. We have been, uh, we've had these scripts since childhood. Scripts are full of blocks and misconceptions that keep our life from going very well, and they keep our body in pain. A script always originates out of pain and suffering. And often it is the child within us that was ignored, repressed, abused, and squashed from expression from a critical parent that still lives within us. And when we are in script, we are identifying with the voices of those unintegrated areas of our life as if they are real. These scripts keep our frequency down while we're playing them out in fear, anger, resentment, and apathy. You see, the subconscious mind takes the thoughts that we have with feeling and emotions and gives us back into our world testimony or evidence that your, your script is real, your fear is real. And as this continues to happen, we suffer with difficulties not realizing that we are the one that has produced this painful picture that we're living out of. Every emotion from a script is motivated by fear and every activity that is based in God consciousness is motivated by love. The old scripts that we have hanging on to us are our critical parent and our child that was ignored, abused, or not respected. But so we, what we want to do is we want to learn to love ourselves enough to listen to what is this within us? What is it saying? What is it saying that was never heard but just pushed down? The scripts are made up of conclusions and suggestions that we have accepted and the, conclu the conclusions that we have formed from these suggestions. A conclu conclusion means, in Webster's Dictionary, it means closure, control, stoppage, final, end, termination, irrevocable, unquestionable, definite, firm, fixed, terminal, and to judge. So you see, every conclusion is made with feeling, and until it is reevaluated, it will persist in coloring our world. Every anxiety, anger, fear, resentment, and depression is based on a conclusion that we have made. And it says this is the way it is. And then a conclusion becomes a law unto us. And our language lets us know when we've reached a conclusion. Look for the words never, always, nobody, everybody, all, and can't. Blame, guilt shame, hostility, and insecurity are emotions from false conclusions 
that we have bought into. Many of our fixed conclusions have been with us since childhood. We have formed conclusions about our family, our bodies, our friends, our neighbors, our jobs, our environments, our health, our finances, and it goes on and on, and our religion has been a big part of that. And all of this makes up our false identity. One of the most revealing, enlightening exercises is to write down headings from some of these conclusions that you have made and just take a look at them. And remember that every conclusion that you write down is misrepresenting what is true. Sometimes we get into arguments and debates defending our conclusions while the other party defends their fixed opinions. And you might ask, well, are we not to have positive conclusions? I mean, there are people that have known spiritual truth for years and they've encased those conclusions around their truth. They know the letter of the law and sometimes this causes a fixed rigidity about them. And joy and dogmatic rigidity do not really do well in the same environment. The more fixed we are, the more it takes to inspire us. Conclusions crystallize the truth and put up partition walls to keep all the conclusions intact and guarded. This can diminish our friends as we find it safer to be with others who have all the same conclusions that we do. There are no boundaries around truth that comes from revelation and inspiration. In other words, it's not a closure. It's unbounded. It's free. It's full of majesty. In the core of our being, we are love without legalistic boundaries. You know, Jesus said the truth we know would bring us freedom. He knew the truth that we knew would only destroy that which was not true. Discovering conclusions is like opening up channels of unadulterated life and substance and feelings of expansiveness and wholeness. Healing can take place instantly, and we call it a miracle. Life is continually sending us teachers to awaken us from false conclusions and the dream of separation from God. The greatest truth is we can uncover and let go of old conclusions we no longer need to live with fixed, toxic attitudes and beliefs. I remember a wonderful uh, client I had in friend. She said, you know, I remember when I was a child, I made a conclusion based on very little evidence. And I functioned in my entire life based on that negative, fixed assumption. And it was, I'm not good enough. And I have come to realize the conditioned mind is like a drug dealer. It pushes I'm not good enough onto most of us, and we get hooked on it, and it becomes an addiction. Feeding on not good enough was a veil that I wore, and my life lived out of that false, negative attitude, and I had it since I was a child, she said. To see through a false conclusion is to break a fraudulent contract and to blow wide open the gates of heaven and to throw off the chains that have bound us. <clears throat> and when the light of your awareness sees the false, fixed decision, be prepared for something remarkably wonderful to happen. We can live out of a realm of discovery Discovery means to be aware, to gain knowledge, to gain knowledge of something not previously known. So discovery is creative. It's true comprehension. When we're in a state of discovery, we're in a state of vibrancy, realization, and inspiration. And we see things in newness. It's like we are seeing in a new light. And our lives take on a sense of wonder and awe. When we are free to live our life in discovery, we see life with innocent perception, yet with accurate awareness and discernment. We are open, we're fluid, we're willing to flow with life instead of resisting what is. Without conclusions clouding our seeing, we have a grasp of what is real and what is not real. An executive client and friend said to me once, she said, I felt so victimized by my colleagues. I realized 
It was from all the conclusions I had of them. They kept performing from my fixed assumptions. I felt one was trying to take over my position. Another was aggressive and combative. Another made no contribution and was a little weird. Well, I decided to remove my conclusions and to operate from a place of not knowing for one week. It was enlightening. And I discovered that they wanted the things I wanted. They wanted to see the greatness in everyone like I did. They wanted breakthrough thinking to take place in the company. They wanted to be aligned with high values. The hard edges of life soften for me when I'm open to discovering life instead of making conclusions. Everybody looked and acted differently. They seemed to have such great ideas. No, I'm not making it important any longer for everyone to fit into my standards of how I think they ought to be. Whenever I feel myself feeling pressured and anxious, I know I'm once again seeing life through deception. I now I know I have to go back to what am I here to discover. Well, here are some conclusions that we've had, or we do have now, that have created some painful scripts for us. The first one is, I will never be accepted and loved the way I am. I have to be different than I am for me to be loved. The second one is, I will always be betrayed by those I trust. The next one, I'll never ever get it right. Number four, I will always be abandoned by those I love and I will never be taken care of. Number five, the only way I'll be loved is if I please them and I'm needed by them. But then I feel like I'm being taken advantage of. Number six, I will always be ignored and treated with indifference. And number seven, I will always feel like I'm not important or have have value. Then there is the granddaddy of all the scripts and it's one that we all seem to have. And it is, I will never be good enough. It is a feeling of not measuring up, never having enough goodness to be healed. Um, And oftentimes the body is used as a means of atonement through sickness and pain. Not being good enough, not smart enough, not beautiful enough, not spiritual enough, um, not good enough for a harmonious, spiritual, satisfying relationship or to have supply. You see, rejection is the bottom line message underlying these beliefs. It is the belief causing the rejection. Notice, I will always or I'll never, the always and never cause the fear within us. The script is an emotional dialogue about what we believe is going to happen to us. Soon we find someone to play the other role in our dialogue and they read the script that we're radiating out. So this means that he or she says or does something that confirms our belief. Unfortunately, this is often our own spouse, members of our family or friends. And then we have an emotional reaction to what we're feeling or hearing. The feeling is usually way out of proportion to what the other person said or did, since it's driven by our own fear. So then our life tone of of energy falls down to fear, anger, and resentment. And we're now unconscious, not able to respond appropriately because we're busy reacting. We've all experienced that, haven't we? Fear, anger, resentment is the world tone. That is why the news looks the way that it does. When we're operating from our old scripts, we're always operating from a lower what we'll call a third dimensional state of consciousness. And everything out here is asking us, it's time to wake up, it's time for transformation, it's time for recalibration. Other higher dimensions are waiting for us. And maybe you're already there and you're operating from those higher places, at least some of the time, I'm sure you are. But looking at old scripts and being willing to let them go is being willing for disclosure and surrender. It is the most profound thing to wake up. The people who are reading our script do not have the power to not read it. Therefore, they are not at fault. So forgiveness is in order. 
and therefore I didn't have the power to not radiate the script at the time I did. So, I am forgiven. You see, we all wrote our scripts in ignorance, and therefore we're not at fault. And now we realize that everything about the script is impersonal, even how it originated is impersonal. And we embrace forgiveness for every participant. And when everyone is forgiven, the pain goes away. Now here are some clues about the script because it does take place in third dimensional consciousness and it's from the past. It's always from the past and it's with projections into the future. It doesn't have to do with now, the present time. And therefore you experience it over and over again like a hamster going around and around with the same tape, the same feelings. Because you see, it's based on conditional love in the third dimensional consciousness. Unconditional love is in the fourth and higher dimensions. In the third dimension, we do not have choices. We have reactions from unconscious beliefs and conditioning from the past. And in the fourth dimension, we have space to respond. Duality plays a huge role in our scripts and is played out from the left hemisphere of our brain. So that is like 4 to 10% of our brain that's being used. So when we're in script, we're just a little stupid, wouldn't you say? To access intuition and to function from higher dimensions and beyond and to access the rest of our brain, we've really got to access the spirituality that is within us waiting to be accessed. Scripts in the third dimension is made up of rigid beliefs, conclusions, inflexible rules and limitations, always keeping us there through fear and threats. The human being's energy frequency is vibrating at a rate of 186,300 miles per second, the speed of light. The source of our body's energy is our spirit. So your spirit knows the truth. Your spirit knows wholeness and wellness. And your spirit knows how to take you there if you can get out of the way. Our perceptions, thoughts, traumas, actions, feelings about ourself, and our words that we speak can create blockages. Our body is made up of mostly water, and that water takes on what we say and feel, which does show up in our bloodstream. These classes help us to be more conscious, less reactive, and more responsive to life, and to live in higher frequencies or tones. Now you realize we do, we tend to go up and down a tone scale of vibrational energy all day long. But we want to live our lives in the higher tones of love and acceptance, and not go to those old scripts of fear, resentment, and anger. Much of humanity live in chronically lower tones of energy. Gurdjieff says there's three states of consciousness, the walking or waking sleep, there is then self-awareness, and there's objective awareness. So let's talk about in the third dimensional state of consciousness, we're going to call that walking or waking sleep. And in this state, we have conditioned mechanical responses. In waking sleep, we go up and down on the tone scale according to circumstances and who we are with and which buttons are being pushed. And this is a chronic state in which most of us have lived our lives. The very first place in the tone scale is a state called apathy. And these people are totally under suggestion. They say things like, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. What's the use? No one understands me. Um, there's no hope for my situation. I'll never get well. You see, they're close to death, so they continually talk in those terms. They feel they're terribly inferior and, and mistreated. So their bodies are operating erratically, and nothing really seems to be functioning well. The next state is, as we're moving up the tone scale, we experience fear. Fearful people are always concerned with what will people think. They hide their true feelings. They change to suit other people. They're anxious about the future, and they do not like necessarily being alone. 
They are suggestible to having sicknesses and prescription drug ads. They're afraid of what could happen to them. They vacillate between should I, what if, and did I or say or do the right thing. They're prone to getting tickets and, and uh, having accidents because they're not in the moment. Fear, resentment, and anger create problems in the body. You see, fear closes down the body functions. Digestive glands halt or decrease the secretion of digestive enzymes and acids. So when that's halted, that, that, that's halted, there's some real indigestion problems. The mouth goes dry, pancreas decreases um, secretion of insulin, the bowels stop working, they can result in chronic col colonitis. Urinary system, the kidneys decrease urine flow and increase water retention. In the bladder control, it becomes more difficult. Brain vessels constrict, hampering our clarity and our thinking. The immune system becomes weakened and we're more open to whatever is floating around. As we move up the tone scale, we move into resentment. And resentment is a combination of fear and anger. And these people, uh, they you know, have insinuating remarks, they're suspicious, they can hold grudges, they're critical, they're judging, they can be dishonest with themselves, and they always are thinking other people are dishonest, they're tense, they find it hard to relax, and they're always seeing a flaw in their world. This person is angry, they feel that they've been used and mistreated, but they're afraid to really do much about it. So they suffered from a continual interceiving. They hold grudges against people. They have, they're very good at all the classic put downs and they enjoy exposing and revealing secrets of other people. They're always prepared to fight or run. Fearful, resentful people fill, fill up medical offices. They have the most ailments. They're reporting to their infinite intelligence that there's an emergency going on and the infinite intelligence does the appropriate thing and sends all the hormones and fluids necessary to fight or run, but they do neither. They stew in those juices, which turns very toxic. Prisons are full of fearful, angry, resentful people and they are often talked into breaking the law. The next state of consciousness is anger as we're moving up the tone scale. This is a much more powerful tone. Um, it's angry people are always sticking up for their rights and their imagination. They constantly feel mistreated, that they're entitled to revenge. They can be blunt and rude to most people around them. They don't think anything of running over others, including their own children, or belittle, belittling them, executing harsh discipline. They're hung up on obedience. They can kill creativity and give incomplete orders. They use threats and alarming lies to dominate. Oftentimes, people in influential positions are in anger. Angry people are in courts. They, they're suing other people. The next tone is we're moving way up on the tone scale is boredom. But remember, we're still in waking sleep. We're still in unconscious uh, places. In boredom, this type is easygoing and pleasant. They can be pretty likable. Uh, they're not, we don't want to confuse them with apathy because these people usually have achieved a certain state of comfort, pleasure, attention, and lots of approval, and in state of importance, they probably had money. And, um, but you see, nothing gratifies them. They're not really interested in anything, and consequently, they don't do much. This type can get very annoyed easily. They can move into uh, anger, but most of the time, they do try to get along. Bored people may say, oh, it's all the same. Oh, I've heard all that before. I've seen it. I've done it all. They look for some kind of excitement that will pull them out of this deplorable uh, situation. They can look to alcohol and maybe drugs. They're not interested in new ideas, and they can be unconcerned about the larger issues in the world. 
and they won't pick a fight usually because they don't really care if you agree with them or not. The next state is way, way up high on the tone scale, and it's contentment, but remember we're still in waking sleep, and we're still in the third dimension. In contentment, people like, they like other people, and they like him, they allow others the right to their ideas, they seldom are grumpy, they're kind, they're sober, they can be beautiful, they work well with other people, and um, they can be alone or not, this type feels that they've made it in life. They're interested in enjoying themselves rather than waking up. They're accept they, they, they can be a success either in worldly terms or as a success in having importance, attention, and approval. They feel 100% conscious with 100% free will. And they're always working towards their ideal and their goal, but they can very easily fall from their high state into fear, anger, or boredom. He is dependent on the outer world for his state of being. They love card games, um, RV parks, over 55 places where they can have other contented folks around them. This is a very high state of waking sleep, but it's still illusion. And until we keep our tone above contentment, we're not in present time, and we're open, open to the suffering of the world. The more fully one understands that one is asleep, the more one is repelled by it and will desire to awaken. Realizing just how repugnant it is to be asleep is a catalyst to awakening. Now it's time that we get into something very wonderful. Do you all understand the beholder or the witness that is within you. It is imperative that today we get introduced to something that is so wonderful. And it is the point of awareness, which we will call the witness for this teacher. And it is within each of us. It can observe your reactions, your hurts, your pain, without a smidgen of condemnation or justification or reaction. And we want to practice observing, observing ourselves as if we're a visitor from another loving dimension and we're seeing this human conditioning for the first time. So now instead of seeing and judging, we're going to observe their reactions and we're going to observe them with deep interest. To move into the fourth dimension of consciousness, we must drop these old frequencies, these old conclusions which make us mechanical and we must move into this heightened awareness. Now we do experience heightened awareness every day probably, but perhaps just for moments. So we're wanting to be present, awake, interested, vitally alert and awake. A mechanical, unawakened person operating in fear, resentment and anger is 100% subject to suggestion 100% of the time. All suggestion offers some gain or reward or threatens some loss or pain. Vital interest is now in the fourth dimension, and it's the fourth dimensional state of consciousness. This is really, really thrilling. And this provides us with an enhanced state of ease, possibility. Uh, it's, we have much more capability in this state than that the structures of the old third dimensional state of consciousness. In vital interest, we're always in present time. The focus is now, and our bodies are all, it, it's really interesting because our bodies are already in present time. Think about it. You're breathing in present time. Your heart beats are in the now moment. Digestion, your blood is flowing, all present time. So when our attention point becomes present time awareness, choice becomes possible once again. We can have a sense of detachment merely as something going on that is interesting but not important. Do you see if you were able to observe a script that is about ready to come forth from within you and you were able to move into vital interest and, and just find yourself interested in it, how different that might be than unconsciously going into that script? One of the wonders of self-awareness that happens is 
that we are aware of the scripts being played within us and in others, and we can now choose to not read that script of another person, which is the most loving thing that we can do. It helps to weaken their script, and we find that we're experiencing less and less separation then from others, and more and more gratitude for ourselves and our own freedom that we are now living out from. Now we find that this wonderful consciousness within us is in operation and in our experience, unless script is in operation once we are able to observe without judgment. We are no longer the problem or the solution. We remember if we see ourselves as a solution, it perpetrates the idea that there is a problem. Get in the habit when seeing a script to acknowledge it by saying, oh, that's interesting. You've taken all importance away from it by just seeing it as interesting. It's just a story. And when seeing someone in emotion and you're not reading it but acknowledging them as a spiritual being and their script has nothing to do with their identity, you have been a gift of consciousness and awareness to this one. This state is called self-awareness. Self-awareness is paying attention to self as an object. It's not condemning or justifying it. It's an observer. This is a new state of consciousness. It's a new way of being. In the self-awareness level of consciousness, there are three states of being. The, low to, the very lowest one is vital interest, but this is the most advantageous place for us to live. You see, when you're in vital interest, you're awake. And uh, remember, Christ said, Awake you that sleep and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. And Paul said that. That light is this awareness. Remember, Jesus said, will you just stay awake with me for one hour? Just one hour, if we could just stay awake to who we are. You can stay vitally interested in observing without identifying. If you do condemn or justify, that is the indication that once again, you're identified. You have fallen back into waking sleep and your consciousness is moving back into the third dimension. Now you are able to see other people without condemning or justifying them, simply being aware of them, which is agape, it's love. This tone begins to open untold vistas of understanding and being that one has never experienced before. So the vital state of being is the beginning of a new person, a new creation. This is when you start moving into the attributes of God that are within you. The body begins to be alert when we start living in more awareness. The face shines. There are still times in the identification process when one gets identified and falls back into apathy and fear, held resentment, anger, and boredom. But one wants more than anything just to stay in the awakened state. Infinite intelligence brings about this new state of the inner being as one is able to let go of the old conclusions, the old scripts, the old illusions. And then one finds that they have an expand, expanded sense of time. They need less sleep. And experiences are more in present time. One finds they rarely get a traffic ticket because they're in harmony in life. They're doing the appropriate thing. One cannot wait to get up in the morning more action, more creativity, all having to do with, a, with fulfillment and also making contributions to life in general, to other people. They have more abundance usually because they are aware of abundance being everywhere. You will discover that each moment that you are observing without judgment, that that is a moment of enlightenment. That which is being observed because it is not authentic, but illusion, diminishes in the light of your awareness. So this observer or witness is able to see when there is something mechanical going on within them. Where there is no will or determination, someone can just press a button and cause them to be angry, or they can hear the news and get fearful. They observe this in themselves and others and they watch, and they wake up. 
There's several things that can keep your tone up. One is self-observation. You move right into vital interest, where you can be in anger and you can move right into, into vital interest when you make up your mind to observe your state of being. Uh, forgiveness keeps your tone up. Gratitude, meditation, having a realization that comes from the spirit within you, watching your breath, your heartbeat, um, realizing that your body is always in present time. All of these help to keep your tone up. So we are waking up and there is so much more light energy right now in our world. And the huge shift is happening. It's pushing us into more and more consciousness. It's awakening our power of potentiality. It is as, it's, it's as though we're in this new beginning. And we've been suspecting for a while that our limitations are over, haven't we? Once we've experienced time and vital interest and we're not taken in by the old scripts or the false suggestions and the old conclusions, we move into those higher levels, of those higher places where we will experience enthusiasm, which is a state of heaven or exhilaration, a state of wholeness. And those are wonderful states and we'll talk about those at another time. When there is a shift in your consciousness, there's a recalibration in your world where your world seems to assist you in every way to stay awake. This universe is divine, so everything comes in to assist you when you are moving into that place of observation. When our spiritual eyes are open, we see heaven all around us. We experience truth and love and joy. We experience an altitude of gratitude. But when we're mesmerized by lies and some old script that we're playing out, all we see are the lies around us and it feels like we have fallen from heaven. Your homework now is to use your awareness to see if you can see scripts in action in yourself and others, that you are able to disidentify from old conclusions See the scripts and others, but see them with compassion.